What do a city planner, roller coaster designer, and a zoologist have in common? Having trouble? What if I showed you this instead? There we go. It's much more clearer now. You can be all of them in a simulator. Duh. If you've played a simulator before, you might know the heart racing thrill of hiring employees through HR, project development, finances, marketing, company strategy. Wait. What is so thrilling about that? How do we get tricked into having fun with simulated jobs? I'm Pengoose, or you can just call me Donnie, and today we're answering how are simulators so real and unreal? First, let's unpack how realistic simulators are. Starting with one of the best city sims in modern times, SimCity. Nah, just kidding. Of course it's City Skyline. As you might expect from the title, you are the urban planner for fictitious cities, but with very real mechanics such as pollution, citizen happiness, city policies, and traffic. Programmer Damian Morello at the small 13-man team Colossal Order defiantly says we do not like faking citizen behaviors. The development for traffic behavior in city skylines is a widely discussed topic in researching about similar mechanics, with several familiar rules if you've driven a car before in real life. You do not rear-end the car in front of you. You don't exceed the speed limit. You stop at red lights. Only one vehicle can be in an intersection at any one time. You don't run over pedestrians. The first vehicle to decide to go to a given location is served first, i.e. who stops first at a stop sign. These are real-life rules put into a simulation. Real, efficient traffic designs were used for reference in designing this traffic system, like the single-point urban interchange or diverging diamond interchange. But with this realism comes a realistic problem too, bottlenecks, gridlocks, or just simple traffic jams. There was one more rule I didn't tell you about that the developers put in. All these rules don't apply when the player isn't looking. An ingenious example of saving CPU and computing requirements for cities with populations upwards to 1 million people. The development team came up with a solution for roads experiencing real-life problems with a gamified solution. They made it so vehicles teleport back to an origin if there was a gridlock. The bottleneck still existed and still has physical vehicles stuck in traffic, but this makes it so the jam doesn't grow uncontrollably. Besides saving computing power, this serves another purpose, to allow players to identify the problem without too much consequence. Game designer Carolina Corpu from Colossal Order says this about the traffic system. The goal ultimately never was to mimic a real city road network, as the game is aimed to many kinds of players and both the ones who want to play optimally and those who wish to create beautiful cities need to have fun. So the game focuses on flexibility with the road systems so that many different solutions can work. This video isn't about psychology of simulators, but I need to interject with this. This is how a brilliantly crafted simulator balances real life with game life. It is all very real, but still a game. But why do they need to do this? Well, players would be all too frustrated if it was too real. Mistakes would fail their cities in no time. This way, by making an obviously fictitious teleport system, although I wish this was real, players can react and fix their mistakes and continue the simulation. The main aspect in enjoying a simulator is the risk-free decision-making, which makes business simulator games a point of interest in education. That's also why we love to have fun and dick around in these simulators. There is no real risk, so people are not afraid in making mistakes. This way, they can learn from these fake mistakes, and now make real ones, and make their beautiful cities. Let's move on to our roller coaster designer, seen in Planet Coaster, for another example of realism that is toned down for players. Frontier Developments in their Dev Diary series on YouTube describe how accurately and realistically guests in your park acknowledge and perceive attractions. Guests are programmed to act like real people, with pathing that mimics real life, constantly valuing your park in real time, and have their own preferences when making decisions. If you've been in a theme park before, this is obviously how you'd walk through the park. Of course, this comes with a catch. These ambitious developers strive for huge crowd sizes in the thousands, but how do they not overwhelm the player while still giving the crowd just enough life to feel very real? Here is lead designer Matthew Florians explaining their solution. Normally, we put a sound on every little thing in the world and it makes a sound and it works really well. But with 2,000 people in a crowd, or even 20,000 people in a crowd, that's the numbers we're looking at, is you're just going to be drowning in sounds. There's going to be no other sound than a lot of people talking. So we're designing these systems that very intelligently look at this large amount of data and pick up exactly those things we want to hear. So with crowds, we're looking at 
informing that there's something that needs investigation, but not actually trying to get all the little details in there. Because if you know something's wrong, you're going to investigate, and that's part of the gameplay. Another clever way of reducing player stimulation, but making the simulation still very real. Not losing sight of gameplay over realism, even simulator sound design is concerned with being too real. Players don't have their eardrums burst with crowd noises, but can still distinguish between guest concerns and exhilarations. I mean, imagining every single person in this crowd saying something is just a nightmare. Finally, let's talk about a zoologist. In the same analysis fashion, let's observe how real this shit is. Literally. Planet Zoo's shit is so real it physically rolls down hills. David Bamber from Planet Zoo's developer journal talks about how much research went into simulating dung, like volume and frequency relative to eating rates and animal size. Of course, animals are the focus of Planet Zoo, and one example of extreme realism is here. One of the most exciting things about working with these animals is to look into what makes each of these animals special. The Indian peafowl, for example, has some really unique behaviors unlike anything else in the animal kingdom. So we will go to the extremes of making sure every feather in the tail of the peacock has its own bone that the animators can use so everything behaves exactly as you'd expect it to. Of course, Planet Zoo also had to make sacrifices. For example, in real life, I don't think placing animals is as easy as clicking a few buttons and putting them in a box. And essentially, low fidelity action. But if you don't know what that means, you'll have to watch my other video. Real subtle promo. Developers also note how delivering food and cleaning exhibits is simplified out of interest of balancing for time constraints with the in-game time clock. To nail this point into the coffin, the reason for these simplifications is, quote, to appeal to a broad range of players, so adding in too much realism or complexity in certain areas could turn people off of the game. On the other hand, we wanted the animal movement and behaviors to be as realistic as they possibly could. As video games strive to be more and more realistic every year, simulators are getting much more impressive. Just take a look at Microsoft Flight Simulator 2020, a marvel of gaming and even technology. At some point, the realism of simulators take over the premise of it being a video game. When you think about it, it's an achievement in gaming when simulators have become too real, which makes them unfun. Because who likes doing real life boring stuff? So I hope it shed some light in some mechanics in simulators, or lack of mechanics, that make simulators as realistic as possible, but still a game that can be enjoyed. I think I speak for everyone when I say, I love me a good simulator. I can't help but sit there for hours just pretending to be something I'm not. Like I said earlier, it's obvious that the evolution of simulators have become more and more real, but at some point, when does it stop becoming a game and just a boring simulator? So I hope I sufficiently explain the game design choices of real life and gaming crossing over. I'm sure you can spot many more in your favorite simulators. This was how simulators are both real and unreal, and if you learned something, then I suggest you subscribe to watch my other videos. It takes one click, it's free, and you can unsubscribe at any time. This was also a shorter video from my last one, so let me know if it's too long or short. Let me know in the comments if you want me to cover a topic, stay tuned for more videos like this one, don't simulate too hard, and I'll see you next time.